Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. It's nice to see you all. We are going to deviate from our uh, regularly scheduled briefing program today uh, to provide you a uh, preview of the President's visit to uh, Europe uh, next week, both for the G8 Summit and then for a visit to Germany. Uh, in order to efficiently use your time today, um, what I am going to suggest is that uh, both my colleagues will stay here with me through the course of the briefing uh, and as we call on you. Uh, regardless of the topic of uh, your question, one of the three of us will hand you, handle your questions. So uh, that I think will uh, keep things moving and get us in and out of here in pretty efficient fashion. So uh, with that, let me introduce my two colleagues. Uh, the first, uh, many of you know, Deputy National Security Advisor uh, Ben Rhodes. And then to my right is uh, Caroline Atkinson. She is the Senior Director for uh, International Economic Issues at the, on the National Security Staff. Uh, and just as importantly, she'll also be the Sherpa for the G8 meeting with the President next week. So both of them will have some opening remarks, and then I'll um, call on you for your questions, and we'll go from there. Okay. So Ben, you want to get us started? Uh, sure. I'll just start by uh, running through our schedule uh, and giving a bit of a preview of what we hope to accomplish at these different stops. Um, we will be arriving uh, in Northern Ireland uh, on uh, Monday morning. And the uh, event that we're having in Belfast is a, the, a speech from the President at the Belfast Waterfront Convention Center. Um, this is the President's uh, first opportunity to address at length uh, the very important support that the United States has provided to the peace process in Northern Ireland over the years uh, and to the development uh, of the economy and society uh, in Northern Ireland. So he'll have a chance here to speak to students. Uh, we've engaged with the leaders of Northern Ireland here at the White House each year on St. Patrick's Day and welcome their efforts to carry forward the reconciliation efforts in Northern Ireland. In the speech, the President will have a chance to talk about how young people in Northern Ireland have to advance those efforts so that the hard-earned peace uh, that has been achieved in Northern Ireland is translated uh, into a lasting, uh, peaceful society and also into greater economic opportunity for the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, following uh, the President's um, speech in Belfast, he will move to Lochern, where the G8 is being uh, held. Uh, Caroline can preview for you uh, the different plenary sessions, um, but the first plenary session will begin that afternoon uh, at around 4.45 local time. Um, and then following the first plenary session, the President will have a bilateral meeting with President Putin uh, of Russia. Uh, this is the first bilateral meeting that the two leaders will have held uh, since, uh, I believe, Los Cabos at G20 last year. Uh, they clearly have a very broad agenda to discuss. Uh, that will include the situation in Syria. Uh, they will include Afghanistan, where uh, Russia has cooperated with us in securing both our uh, transit routes uh, for our troops uh, and also promoting stability in the region. Uh, it will include nuclear weapons, arms control, missile defense, uh, and the security issues that we very regularly uh, discuss with uh, Russia. Uh, we'll also discuss issues related to counterterrorism cooperation, uh, as well as uh, deepening our economic and commercial ties between our two nations. Uh, following that bilateral meeting, and there will be uh, uh, a chance for the leaders to make statements uh, at the conclusion of that meeting. Uh, there will be a leaders-only working dinner. Uh, this is the dinner that focuses on foreign policy at, at the G8. Uh, the other sessions Caroline can work, walk you through. Uh, I'd anticipate uh, a very wide-ranging conversation at the dinner. Um, Afghanistan will certainly be a subject. Uh, a lot of our key partners on Afghan policy uh, will be represented at the dinner. Uh, as we approach uh, our milestone of transitioning lead responsibility for security uh, to the Afghans, they can discuss the transition uh, underway uh, in Afghanistan, uh, as well as our plans uh, for supporting the Afghan government after 2014. They'll clearly discuss the situation in Syria uh, to include uh, the most recent uh, chemical weapons assessment that we've provided, uh, the efforts that are underway to support both the opposition but also a political settlement in, in the country. Uh, I think they'll discuss more broadly the transitions underway in the Middle East and North Africa. The G8 has been a good venue for that, uh, dating back to Deauville. Uh, that will include, for instance, the types of support we can provide uh, to security forces in countries like Libya uh, that are working uh, to establish institutions uh, of the state. Uh, and I believe they'll cover some other foreign policy issues. Uh, Iran and our ongoing efforts related to the Iranian nuclear program uh, are certainly likely to come up. Uh, I should add, uh, the President has been consulting with uh, G8 partners in the run-up uh, to this meeting. Uh, he spoke to Prime Minister Abe uh, the other night, uh, both about uh, the upcoming G8 and his recent consultations with uh, the Chinese leader. Um, he will be doing a uh, civets, the President will, with his Quint counterparts uh, later today, 
that includes the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, and Italy. Uh, so the five of them will have an opportunity to discuss uh, the agenda for the G8 uh, in advance uh, of the meetings. Today. A secure, uh, sorry, a video conference. Uh, forgive my jargon. Um, that will uh, conclude the, uh, the first day. The second day is plenary sessions of the G8. So I will leave, uh, I will leave it to Caroline to walk you through the different uh, plenary sessions on the second day. Uh, I would only add that, as is often the case uh, at these meetings, we'd anticipate that the President will have an opportunity to see other leaders on the margins uh, of the G8 uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, then on, on, we will fly to Germany on Tuesday night and spend the night in Berlin. Um, this visit, uh, I think, reinforces how critical the U.S.-German relationship is, both as a part of the transatlantic uh, partnership and also in terms of uh, our deep bilateral ties. Uh, we'd expect the agenda um, uh, throughout the course of the meetings in Germany uh, to focus on both economic and security issues, and I'll get to that a little bit when I get to uh, our meeting with Chancellor Merkel. But the President will begin the day uh, with uh, a meeting with the President uh, of Germany. Uh, following that, he will go uh, to the Chancellery for his bilateral meeting with Chancellor Merkel. Uh, he and Chancellor Merkel have developed a very close working relationship uh, since uh, the beginning of 2009. They've worked through a number of delicate crises together, both economic and security. Uh, I'd anticipate that they'll discuss the ongoing situation in the Eurozone uh, and the global economy. Uh, they'll discuss uh, the uh, trade negotiations uh, associated with uh, a potential uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. They'll discuss uh, the situation in Afghanistan, where Germany remains uh, a stalwart ally and continues to contribute uh, to the mission there, uh, as well as, again, how NATO can provide support uh, beyond 2014. Uh, I'd also anticipate they'll discuss Syria, uh, Iran, and Middle East peace uh, as issues that we regularly consult closely with the Germans on. Uh, following the bilateral meeting, there'll be a press conference, uh, and then they'll have a private lunch together uh, at the Chancellery. Uh, then following uh, lunch, the President will give remarks uh, at the Brandenburg Gate. Um, this is uh, an historic uh, site for uh, the German people uh, and for U.S. Presidents. Um, it comes on the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's speech, which was not at the Brandenburg Gate, uh, but was at the height of the uh, Cold War when uh, Germany, uh, West Berlin was uh, under considerable siege. Um, it's also, uh, again, uh, notable in one respect in that it, it is the eastern side of the gate that the President will be speaking on, something that would have been impossible 50 years ago. Uh, but given the progress that's been made in Germany, given the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of the country, uh, it's a true symbol uh, of the partnership that we've forged together. Uh, I'd expect the President hit on uh, broad themes in that speech associated with the shared history uh, of the transatlantic alliance, how far we've come together uh, with Germany and our other allies, uh, but the need to take that same spirit of cooperation and activism uh, that led us to work together through the Cold War uh, and apply that to the challenges that we face today, uh, whether it's nuclear weapons and nonproliferation, uh, our efforts, uh, again, to promote human dignity uh, and democratic values around the world, uh, some of the significant security challenges uh, that we face. I think you'll see the President cover uh, essentially the agenda that the transatlantic alliance has uh, in, here in the 21st century. And we can uh, talk more about that if you'd like. Uh, following uh, the remarks at the Brandenburg Gate, uh, the President will meet with uh, the leader of the Social Democratic Party, uh, Mr. Steinbrook, um, as the principal opposition leader in the country. Uh, then that night, uh, he'll be hosted uh, at a dinner uh, and reception uh, by uh, Chancellor Merkel, and that will conclude the state visit uh, to Germany. Um, before I turn over to Caroline. Uh, I'd also note that the First Lady uh, and Sasha Malia will also be joining uh, President Obama's uh, uh, trips. Um, they will uh, come to Belfast, where they will attend the President's remarks to local students there. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the First Lady and the girls will travel to uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, this is, a, I think, an important signal to send, given how close the United States and Ireland are. Um, that uh, she's able to visit there. Uh, they were invited uh, to visit uh, the last time uh, that uh, the President uh, was in Ireland, uh, and this will be uh, an opportunity uh, for the First Lady and the girls to accept that hospitality. Um, they will tour Trinity College, which is uh, Ireland's oldest university uh, in Dublin, uh, where she'll be able to explore the archives that they've gathered uh, to document the Obama's Irish ancestry, which is well known to you all. Uh, <coughs> later in the day, uh, she will meet with uh, the staff and families of our embassy in Dublin. She will join some Irish youth for a Riverdance performance 
uh, at the historic uh, Gaiety Theater. Uh, she'll be joined there by Fiona Kenny, the wife of the Taoiseach, uh, and Sabina Higgins, the wife of the President of Ireland, um, th uh, who will also uh, join that event with her. Uh, then they will rejoin the President uh, in Berlin, uh, and the independent uh, event that they'll have is on June 19th. Uh, the First Lady will visit the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe uh, in Mar Park, where she will tour the Wall Park with uh, Chancellor Merkel's husband, um, Dr. Sauer, um, and Mrs. Obama will also visit the Reichstag before rejoining the President for the uh, official dinner hosted by Chancellor Merkel. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn over to Caroline and then we'll be able to take your questions. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, so Lochern will be President Obama's fifth G8 summit. And as you know, G8 members uh, account for about 50% of the world's global GDP and they also include some of our closest allies and partners. Last year, when President Obama hosted the G8 at Camp David, he returned it to a small, intimate, action-oriented uh, event with just uh, those few leaders together. One example of uh, the actions that we did then was the launch of the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. That now is up to $3.7 billion in private sector pledges, and we've expanded from the original three African countries that were announced and joined the G8 last year to nine countries and more are ready to join this year. Prime Minister Cameron said that he wanted to take a similar approach of candid conversations amongst a group, a small group of leaders at Loch Earn. So that's just a bit of the background uh, and atmospherics. The first session of the summit will be on the global economy on Monday afternoon. The context for that discussion has changed a lot over the past year. In Europe, for example, financial tensions have eased considerably. But large parts of Europe remain in recession, and unemployment in some countries is at record highs. In the US, our recovery is underway. We've successfully avoided the fiscal cliff, and our budget deficit is declining rapidly. But of course, we have more work to do to create jobs. As at Camp David, we expect that G8 leaders will express a consensus that growth and jobs are a top priority. As Ben mentioned, there will then be the working dinner just amongst leaders. And on Tuesday morning, there will be another leaders-only session to discuss a range of issues around counterterrorism. That will be followed by a session on trade, tax, and transparency issues in the G8 countries themselves. That discussion this year will underscore some of the President's most important economic priorities. On trade, <coughs> the summit will take place just as we're concluding our consultation period here with Congress on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. On taxes, we expect the G8 to make important progress on the issues both of illegal tax evasion and the kind of legal tax <coughs> avoidance that uh, companies, when they use countries' loopholes, manage to shift their profits to low, no or low tax jurisdictions. Now, international tax has been a core piece of President Obama's agenda since he first ran for president in 2008. In 2009, he proposed legislation called FATCA to crack down on illegal tax evasion by increasing disclosure requirements for individuals and financial institutions. Congress passed FATCA in 2010. Since then, the Treasury Department has been working with using these tools, engaging with other governments to ensure that tax evasion is detected and punished. And at Loch Earn, we're going to be working with the G8 to expand this use of the FATCA standard. Now, beyond that, we'll also be working at the G8 with uh, Prime Minister Cameron and the others to improve the ability of tax authorities and law enforcement to identify the real people behind shell companies that are sometimes set up and facilitate uh, the hiding of, uh, of tax li liabilities. Increasing transparency around company ownership, what's called beneficial ownership, will help to prosecute illegal evasion and other illicit activity, money laundering, terrorist financing, and so on. In addition to these efforts to combat tax evasion, illegal tax evasion, the President has been focused on international efforts to reduce what is legal tax avoidance, when companies legally use loopholes that exist 
in our laws and other laws to reduce their tax liability. Tax avoidance is as much about countries and country rules as it is about companies because the loopholes that the companies use are the result of the rules that countries set. Last year in February, President Obama laid out a detailed framework for business tax reform which included uh, proposals to take this problem on. And the G8 summit will provide an opportunity to highlight the need to remove tax incentives that encourage companies to shift profits around and instead replace those incentives with ones that will encourage the creation of jobs and investment at home. And there is work underway in the G20, the broader grouping beyond the G8 and the OECD to think through these issues and to prevent races to the bottom in tax policy. We want to avoid tax competition turning into a lose-lose proposition where countries not only lose revenue, but companies make inefficient decisions by locating where they pay the lower taxes or shifting their profits to the lower taxes rather than where it is most productive for them to invest and produce. The next session on Tuesday is a working lunch which will include African and other leaders and the heads of international organizations to talk about the development aspects of the UK agenda, which will include also these tax and transparency issues. We have put particular emphasis on the extractive sector and transparency in the extractive sector through uh, Dodd-Frank. The United States was the first to require companies to disclose the payments that they make to governments in the extractive sector. And uh, we welcome the steps that were taken just yesterday by the EU to adopt very similar legislation and the announcement from Canada that they were also seeking to work to align with these standards. And this is an area where the G8 can actually be at its best, where it rises to a challenge and agrees to take action that we can do in our own countries that raise standards around the world and ensure that everybody is competing on a level playing field. The final session on Tuesday will be a short session just to conclude, bring the G8 together, perhaps talk about uh, next year's agenda. And uh, let me just say that uh, these summits are important both because they set the agenda on ongoing collaborative work, foreign policy and the global economy, and they also allow leaders to highlight and discuss candidly among themselves important issues and then press for action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben and Caroline. It sounds like it's going to be a very busy three days next week. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, Jim, we'll give you the first question, but we do want to try to hop around today. So people in the back, <coughs> start thinking of your questions. Uh, Jim, you want to start? <laughs> thanks, Josh, and, and thanks to both of you for doing this. Uh, ben, on, on Syria, um, will, will decisions, you, you guys haven't talked specifically about what the, what the military support issues are, but will decisions on military support uh, depend in part on the outcome of the talks that the president will have with G8 leaders, um, and and given the position that the that the French and the British have staked out, is there an expectation that they might accelerate their decision making on any military support that they might provide? Uh, well, thanks, Jim. Um, first of all, uh, the deci decisions that we've made uh, are are already finalized. Um, so the the president's decision to increase support for the Syrian opposition, including the Supreme Military Council, the SMC, which is, uh, again, the principal fighting force on the ground that we've been working with. Those are decisions that he's made over the course of the last several weeks, um, particularly as our assessment of chemical weapons use uh, firmed up uh, and as we saw a deteriorating situation in general uh, with outside actors like Iran and Hezbollah getting involved. Uh, so this has been a steady increase for us. Uh, you know, we have steadily increased both the size and scope of our assistance to the political opposition and to the SMC, and, and we've decided to take uh, an additional step forward in providing uh, a, a dramatically increased assistance uh, to the <coughs> SMC going forward. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, this is a fluid situation, so it's necessary for him to consult with uh, all the leaders of the G8 about uh, both our chemical weapons assessment uh, and the types of support we're providing to the opposition. With the French and the British, they have shared uh, our positions generally on Syria. They've been a part of the co core group of essentially 11 countries uh, in the Middle East uh, and in Europe that have worked together to strengthen the Syrian opposition. Uh, I will leave it to them to make their own um, announcements. They did, of course, lift uh, the embargo that was in place that prevented 
uh, arms flowing from the uh, European Union uh, into Syria. Um, but uh, I think he'll be discussing with those leaders what the best way forward is. He'll hear from them what their plans are. Um, uh, thus far, uh, they've been important partners, the French and the British in particular, in sharing information and intelligence related to chemical weapons. So we'll continue to do that going forward. We note Prime Minister Cameron's uh, constructive statement today welcoming uh, our assessment. Uh, but this will be a, a, an ongoing uh, dialogue between the President and his fellow leaders. Um, you said the President has made these decisions over the past couple of weeks. Does, does that, are, are fighters on the ground already seen uh, some of this uh, support? Well, um, first of all, we've had, uh, again, an upward trajectory of assistance in general. Uh, and they have already seen certain types of assistance uh, that has reached uh, into Syria. Uh, examples of that might be uh, what we traditionally call MREs, Meals Ready to Eat, uh, and medical uh, kits. Uh, but the additional types of assistance um, that uh, we will be providing to them going forward, um, it obviously takes time from uh, a decision uh, for that assi assistance to reach people in Syria. Um, g given the, the way in which uh, we implement uh, our assistance um, programs, uh, I can't give you uh, a specific timeline or itemized list of what uh, that assistance is and when it will get there. But uh, suffice to say, what we've been able to do by developing a relationship with the SMC as well as the Syrian Opposition Coalition over the course of the last uh, six months or so uh, is to develop relationships uh, to find individuals, uh, for instance, like General Idris of the SMC, uh, who we are focusing this assistance towards. Uh, that's important because it both allows you to get assistance uh, into the hands of those who need it, but it also allows you to uh, have protections uh, to try to keep assistance from reaching those who we don't want to uh, receive material. Uh, for instance, Al Nusra, uh, which has generally been the m uh, most uh, extremist element of the opposition. And, and you, mentioned, you mentioned Cameron's support, but not so much from, from the Russians. Uh, the, the foreign minister uh, said that, uh, that, that the data that you're citing, intelligence data, didn't look too convincing. What does that <coughs> say about establishing the level of trust that you need uh, at the beginning of the G8 meetings with Putin's presence there and in the bilateral this will mm -hmm. clearly come up? Well, look, we've had differences with Russia uh, on Syria. Um, and uh, all I'd say with respect to the chemical weapons uh, assessment that we briefed to them uh, is that we have a broad range of evidence associated with uh, the multiple incidents of chemical weapons use uh, that we assessed took place. Um, that includes um, open source reporting, it, it includes uh, intelligence reporting, it includes uh, the accounts of individuals, it also includes physiological samples uh, of sarin uh, that we've obtained from uh, within Syria. Um, so we assess with high confidence that sarin has been used, uh, and frankly, uh, the regime maintains custody of these weapons. Uh, so uh, both because of our own uh, intelligence assessment and because of the fact that we uh, believe that the regime has uh, maintained possession of its chemical weapons arsenal, uh, leads us to the very firm conclusion that any use of chemical weapons would have been uh, by the regime. At the same time, uh, we still continue to discuss with the Russians whether there's a way uh, to bring together elements of the regime and the opposition to achieve a political settlement. We have no illusions that that's going to be easy. We still have a difference with the Russians, for instance, on the fact that we believe Bashar al-Assad would have to leave power as a part of that uh, process. Uh, but we'll continue those talks. Uh, and frankly, the type of relationship we have with the Russians uh, is such that even as we have disagreements and even strong disagreements in some areas, we want to work together uh, on issues where we do have convergence of interest, uh, such as nuclear security, counterterrorism, uh, and the situation in Afghanistan. So, uh, Jeff, <coughs> uh, Ben, following up on that, um, do you expect that President Putin will move at all on the Syria position uh, as a result of this bilat? And do you have any, any more details you can share with us today, or will the President share more details with the G8 leaders who will no doubt ask um, about the extent of the military support that you'll be providing? And I have a question for Caroline as well. Sure. On, the, uh, on President Putin, um, uh, I, I, would, um, I would hesitate to, uh, uh, you know, characterize his views. Uh, he, he's very uh, good at doing that. Um, I think, you know, what I think what we would say with respect to um, uh, the, the Russian position on Syria generally is that uh, what Russia has articulated to us, uh, and publicly, uh, is that they don't want to see a downward spiral. They don't want to see a chaotic and unstable situation in the region. They don't want to see extrem extremist elements gaining a foothold in Syria. 
Uh, and the point that we've made to Russia is that the current course in which Assad uh, is not being appropriately pressured um, uh, to step down from power by uh, those who continue to support him in the international community is bringing about those very outcomes. Uh, so it's in Russia's interest to join us in applying pressure uh, on Bashar al-Assad to come to the table in a way that relinquishes uh, his power uh, and his standing in Syria, uh, because we don't see any scenario where he restores his legitimacy to lead the country. Uh, so we're fundamentally making an interest-based argument to the Russians uh, that they can best protect their interests by being a part of a political settlement that is real and that enables a transition away from Assad's rule, but preserves some elements of the institutions of the state, preserves some elements of the regime, uh, but again, respects the rights of the Syrian people and brings in uh, the opposition who we believe uh, speaks for the majority of the, of the country. Um, uh, and on the, on, yeah, I, you know, I think the, the president will definitely be um, discussing the types of aid and assistance that we provide uh, into Syria. Again, in particular, the countries that work with us on that uh, are our European allies, and the French and the British uh, have been the most prominent in that regard. Uh, so I think he'll be discussing it broadly. Uh, he'll also have opportunities uh, to see the leaders uh, on the um, margins of these meetings as well. Um, I should have added that you know we fully anticipate I'll have a chance, for instance, to spend some time with Prime Minister Cameron uh, before the G8. It may not be a formal bilat, but uh, we expect them to have some time together. So he, he'll be uh, he'll be having those discussions uh, again, given the nature of the assistance and. Um, uh, uh, you know, how we provide assistance generally in situations like this. Um, it's it, not an instance where we can be specific about every single uh, aspect of what we're doing, uh, but I think that the general point that we've made is to I, uh, indicate that because of the actions that we've seen taken, including chemical weapons use, we've decided to take this step of increasing, again, both the size and the scope of assistance, including to the military council. Just for Caroline, um, on corporate tax avoidance, what sort of concrete or substantive um, outcomes could you expect from those discussions in the G8? I think the G8 leaders will be able to give a political push to the importance of work that's ongoing on this. And just to mention here in the, in the U.S., the president has championed proposals to ensure that com companies cannot shift their profits to places where there's no taxation, for example, with the, with the proposal for a minimum tax on foreign earnings that is part of his white paper. And we need to have a comprehensive solution. What we really want to see is all of the G8 countries agreeing that there are a number of different measures. This is an important goal for them all to work towards. And uh, we should be rewarding incentives for, for companies to invest and create jobs here at home if it makes sense for them to do that and make their productive decisions here. Beyond sort of that rhetoric, I mean, we know that the president supports that. Will it move to anything that will actually have a concrete effect? I think that these political uh, moves by G8 leaders do translate into an effect because they push uh, the processes that otherwise might be going more slowly, and they also uh, involve governments committing to take different actions. We know that uh, that what we have put forward. We are going to ask uh, the OECD, for example, is working on a template for more transparency by companies. I expect that there will be a strong support from G8 leaders on that. Other countries, including the UK, are now stepping forward and saying they also want to make important efforts in this area so that international tax policy doesn't develop into a race to the bottom. And that's an important outcome for uh, because all of these measures require us to go home and take individual actions ourselves. But having that collective commitment to work on these issues is important. Okay. Through to the back. Nadia? Thank you. Um, ben, can you help us to understand a little bit better of um, why it took you so long to conclude that Assad used chemical weapons while the French and the British already said that a while ago? Because some of the cynics will say it's because of the opposition is losing on the ground and that's why you came up. And why is it that 150 dead by chemical weapons is a game changer, but not 93,000 dead by conventional weapons? Um, well, I'll take the second question first. We've clearly been uh, in strong opposition to what's been taking place in Syria for two years. Um, the use of conventional force against civilians is what led us in the first instance to say that Bashar al-Assad had to step down to put in place a sanctions regime, uh, to rep 
uh, recognize uh, the Syrian opposition coalition as a legitimate representative that we could deal with for the Syrian people uh, and to try to mobilize an international response. Uh, at the same time, the use of chemical weapons violates clear international norms. Uh, for decades, the international community sought to strengthen a norm against the use of this type of weapon, uh, given uh, both its potential for mass casualty uh, and given the type of weapon of mass destruction uh, that it is and the effects we've seen it have uh, when it's been used in, in past history. So this isn't just a red line for the United States in our view. It should be a red line for the international community generally. Uh, with respect to our timing, um, we've been driven by uh, our intelligence assessments uh, of uh, potential incidents. Uh, and uh, if, uh, even the incidents that we uh, have uh, you know, established high confidence about, uh, most of those you're talking about things that have taken place um, in the last several months, uh, you know, in uh, 2013. Um, in terms of the time from April, essentially what we had in April was an initial intelligence assessment. Uh, and the President's direction was uh, to continue to investigate uh, additional corroborating facts and information so that we could raise our confidence level, because uh, that was not a high confidence assessment, and we didn't feel like we had uh, enough corroborated information um, to reach that high uh, degree of confidence that uh, this red line had been crossed. What's been done in the course of the last several weeks is we've been able to piece together a broader information picture. Uh, so you're able to take, for instance, an assessed incident of chemical weapons use. You're able to receive uh, reporting from individuals uh, who were there on the ground. You're able to review physiological samples that have been collected uh, at the site. You're able to review open source reporting from social media uh, and other things uh, that speak to uh, the use of chemical weapons uh, in an area. And we're able to review our own intelligence reporting, uh, which um, obviously covers a range of different means. Uh, and piecing together that information picture, the intelligence community is able to increase its confidence level. Um, and so that's what led to the announcement yesterday. It was driven by uh, the firming up of this assessment over the course of the last several weeks, which the President had asked for uh, after the announcement we made uh, in April. And now what we'll do is we'll share that with the French and British and others, uh, who, by the way, we've been in touch with on these, um, on these uh, assessments uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of months. Um, and together we want to focus on uh, what each country uh, knows about what's happened in Syria. Uh, but we also want to present this information to the United Nations. And today, uh, Ambassador Rice uh, uh, delivered a letter to uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, detailing some of the incidents that we had particularly uh, been focused on. Uh, and we're seeking to push this into the UN system as well, both because the UN investigation has been frustrated uh, and also because the, the UN and the Security Council are appropriate venues uh, to discuss issues like the use of chemical weapons. Okay. Mark? Yeah, Ben, can you tell us more, any more than you were not able to tell us yesterday uh, about what is going to be sent uh, to the, uh, the, the Rebel uh, Council uh, in any, any specificity and also the timing, how soon it can get to them. As you know, uh, the, the government forces are, uh, there's reports again of, of, of fighting around Aleppo. Uh, they seem to have the upper hand. Is it going to reach the Rebels in time? Well, what I, let me start by talking about what we're trying to achieve here. Um, because uh, that's the best way, I think, to answer your question. Um, we believe that, again, the SMC, the Supreme Military Council, um, uh, deserves our support, just as the political opposition does. And what we want to do with our assistance is strengthen their effectiveness um, so that they have uh, better capabilities um, uh, as they uh, are pursuing their efforts within Syria. Uh, we want to strengthen their cohesion uh, because uh, it's a very difficult situation when you have essentially fighting uh, scattered across uh, the country. We want to connect them well to us, but also to our other partners who are providing assistance, countries uh, like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, Turkey, uh, and others, uh, so that uh, they are able to, to receive assistance in a, in a timely manner. Uh, those are the types of objectives we're tr seeking uh, to meet uh, through the decision that the President has made. Um, again, I'm not going to be able to say, here's the specific list of uh, every type of uh, item that we'll be delivering into Syria. Uh, we do want to be responsive uh, to uh, the requests that have been made uh, by the SMC and, and General Idris, uh, consistent with our own national interests. Um, so we'll, we'll seek to be responsive uh, with that very important uh, caveat. Uh, and we'll seek to get uh, assistance into Syria in a timely way. And again, we've already established pipelines to do that. Um, so we already have huge amounts of humanitarian assistance going in the country, significant amounts of 
uh, non-lethal types of assistance, uh, and even assistance with military uses, um, you know, uh, such as I mentioned on the medical and uh, food side uh, earlier. So the pipelines exist to uh, provide uh, assistance into the SMC. Uh, and that will allow us uh, a, to ramp up our assistance. Even if you don't have any, a complete list, can't you even say small arms, RPGs, heavier weapons, and weeks, months, yeah. years? Well, on the first uh, question, I, 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 I obviously completely understand uh, the, the interest. Um, again, we're just not going to be able to get into that level of detail uh, about the type of assistance that we uh, provide um, uh, publicly here. Um, in terms of uh, timelines, this has been a, a, you know, we've established these pipelines, so uh, I think you should see this as a continuum. And so, um, it, you know, uh, there's already material that has been flowing into the opposition, uh, and that will continue to be the case in the, in the weeks to come. Uh, so we don't anticipate that this is something that is, you know, far off into the future. This is part of the continuum of assistance that we provided, because we've already been dealing directly with the SMC. And this gets to the timing issue uh, as well. You know, we have relationships today in Syria that we didn't have six months ago that gives us greater certainty not just that we can get stuff into the country, uh, but also that we can put it in the right hands so that it's not falling into the hands of extremists. Yeah. Ben, give us a, a better understanding. How, explain how does the provision of small arms, given the fact that most of the rebels already have small arms of that sort, how does that convince Bashar al-Assad not to use chemical weapons again? Well, uh, again, I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to get into kind of a, a detailed description of, um, of different types of assistance. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, what, what I'd say is, um, first of all, as a general matter, we want the opposition to be as strong as possible um, because uh, both, <coughs> frankly, for the, the reason that uh, they are faced with a brutal regime that has shown no restraint and the actions that they've uh, taken against them, uh, and also because of the fact that we've seen this increased foreign involvement, uh, particularly from Iran and Hezbollah. Um, we believe that uh, we can make a difference. And keep in mind, it's not just the United States that's providing assistance into, into Syria. We have a number of Arab um, partners uh, who are also focused on providing assistance. Turkey has uh, been a partner as well. Um, so we believe that, uh, again, we have uh, a coalition of countries that is prepared uh, to support uh, the Syrian opposition. And uh, again, this will improve their capabilities, this will improve their effectiveness um, within Syria. Uh, at the same time, uh, they need to continue to strengthen their cohesion so that they can function in different parts of the country. Um, you've already seen uh, that the fighting you know, runs from Aleppo in the north down to Qasar in the south. Um, so we need to make sure that they are also, um, again, able to firm up their position and be uh, a coordinated uh, body uh, across the country. Given the fact that they've fallen behind in, in a variety of cities throughout the country as per reporting from on the ground there right now, was it a mistake for the U.S. and for other allies to not take this action at this level two years ago? Well, first of all, what we've seen over the course of the last two years is momentum has uh, ebbed and flowed within uh, Syria. And at any given time, you can assess that um, either the regime or the opposition has uh, some initiative. Uh, as a general matter, Bashar al-Assad has been rejected by the, <coughs> we believe, significant majority of his people. Uh, and that's not a genie that you can put back in the bottle. Uh, so we don't think that there's any way uh, for the Syrian regime to uh, prevail in this conflict in a way that um, obtains security for them, uh, because the leader of Syria has no legitimacy among his people. Um, in terms, so again, on the momentum question, Ultimately, we still believe that uh, there's not a scenario we can foresee where Bashar al-Assad can remain in power in a country that uh, so clearly uh, rejects his rule, and an international community uh, that broadly rejects his rule, even as he has uh, some uh, basis of support. Um, in terms of the, the timeline, um, these are not uh, the types of you know, steps that we've taken to increase our support for the opposition are not steps that the President takes lightly um, for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, uh, because we need to know that there's a co cohesive and coherent opposition that we can work with. Um, you know, a year ago, the opposition was not nearly as advanced in terms of having a political entity like the SOC uh, that was broadly representative of the Syrian people. There was not uh, an organized uh, entity like the SMC, uh, the Supreme Military Council, uh, on the ground. What you had is far more disparate groups of opposition fighters in different parts of the country. So 
that type of organized opposition uh, was was not in existence. Similarly, as I said, we've been able to develop our own relations uh, with the opposition and seek to do things to isolate the more extremist elements uh, of that opposition. But again, we are doing this uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that um, there needs to be a consequence um, for a regime that uses chemical weapons uh, and uh, the opposition on the ground uh, needs additional support uh, given the dire situation of being faced with a regime that used chemical weapons and has this type of foreign fighter support uh, as well. And if, and if Assad falls, then what prevents the al-Nusra front from then taking control? What measures are being put in place to make sure that that is the, is the, <coughs> the regime that follows suit? Well, that's another reason uh, for us to uh, make sure that we're supporting a more moderate opposition. Uh, and again, our you know, I know there's a big focus, you know, understandably, on the military side of things. Our assistance runs the gamut um, to the types of assistance that allows the opposition to provide uh, for some humanitarian and basic services for the Syrian people. Um, but we want to be strengthening individuals within Syria and organizations within Syria that are more moderate, uh, such that we're isolating extremist elements. And by the way, this is a point we've made to other countries in the region. Uh, that uh, those countries that are providing support into Syria should focus that support towards the more moderate opposition uh, and seek to isolate extremist elements that could present, present a security challenge even after Bashar al-Assad is, is removed. Peter Mayer. Thanks. Uh, ben, there's been, as you know, something of an outcry in some of the countries that will be represented at the G8 uh, about the uh, intelligence programs that have been disclosed over the past week or so. What's the president going to tell the other leaders about uh, the uh, telephone record keeping that's been uh, undertaken by the NSA and, and the web searches? <clears throat> well, I think, you know, he'll be able to uh, discuss with the other leaders uh, the importance of these programs in terms of our counterterrorism efforts in particular, uh, the constraints and safeguards that we place uh, on these programs uh, so that they have oversight against uh, potential uh, abuses. Uh, and all of these countries, um, at the G8 are important counterterrorism partners. Uh, and uh, together we've worked with them uh, on an intelligence and security relationship uh, to foil uh, terrorist attacks uh, in the United States and in Europe. Um, and of course, Russia shares uh, a significant counterterrorism interest with us as well. Um, and you know, th that speaks to the fact that terrorism is a global threat. Um, you know, we, uh, if you look at a country like Germany, um, you know, we all remember, of course, that. Uh, that was one uh, area of staging for 9-11 hijackers. So if you don't have an ability to share information, um, uh, we are going to remove, we'd remove a tool that is essential to our shared security. Um, but we uh, certainly understand uh, that, like the United States, countries in Europe uh, have significant interests in privacy and civil liberties. Uh, so we will want to uh, hear their questions and have an exchange uh, about these programs and other uh, counterterrorism uh, programs that we, we uh, pursue in the United States and in partnership. Peter um, First, Ben, to the German visit and then to Caroline on the TTIP. Um, ben, uh, Mr. President, looking forward to that he finally speaks at the Brandenburg Gate, something he wasn't able to in 2008, to the disappointment of many, yeah. and then a the second question. Well, uh, yes, um, you know, that we, we, we understood when we attended in 2008, when we went to Berlin, that um, uh, you know, the Brandenburg Gate is a, a, a site of particular resonance to the German people, um, and it's a site that had been uh, reserved for heads of state in the past, uh, and we certainly accepted that uh, judgment. At the same time, we could not have received a warmer welcome uh, in Berlin generally, uh, and were able to speak essentially in the vicinity of the area. Um, but I think this is particularly meaningful. Uh, Any time a U.S. president is able to stand at the Brandenburg Gate uh, or sp stand in the heart of Berlin, it's an opportunity for him to speak to not just the role of Germany and the United States in Germany, but essentially uh, it's the role of the West in the free world. Um, and we had challenges in the Cold War that we shouldered together, uh, and I think his message is very much going to be that just because the threat is not um, immediately apparent with a wall and barbed wire, it doesn't mean that we don't have work to do together. But Chancellor Merkel extended this invitation uh, when she was here for uh, the state visit uh, that the President uh, hosted for her. Um, and he was uh, honored to receive that invitation and in preparations for the trip. Uh, the government of Germany and the city of Berlin uh, could not have been uh, more hospitable uh, in arranging, I think, what will be a very uh, powerful event uh, there in uh, the heart of, of Berlin, where you have not just the Brandenburg Gate, but uh, you have uh, the, you know, the new American embassy uh, that has been built, 
uh, and obviously the new German government buildings that symbolize the openness of the, the new Germany as well. So uh, he's very much looking forward to it. And ben, ben, German internet users had to learn that they were among the bigger targets of the NSA prison program. Um, what, there is a huge public outcry in Germany about that. Um, what kind of impact will that have on the success of the president's yeah. trip to Germany? We, we understand the, uh, the, the significant German interest in, in privacy and civil liberties. Uh, I think the point that we will make is in addition to the types of safeguards against abuse that we have, this is not a program that is intended um, to uh, target individuals for what they're doing uh, online other than to seek to uncover terrorist uh, plots and nexus to terrorism. Um, so uh, I think our, our point is that this is uh, focused very specifically on one goal, which is uh, you know, how do we disrupt terrorist activity? How do we mitigate security threats both to us uh, and to Germany? But it's a discussion that uh, he'll have with the Chancellor, uh, and uh, he'll obviously be able to address it uh, publicly while he's there as well. Caroline, um, how important is it that negotiations on a transatlantic trade and investment partnership starts without any exclusions of certain topics like media industry, for instance, how some in Europe want to do? I think we've made clear that uh, we are very much in support of a, of a broad and comprehensive negotiation. We understand, of course, that both sides have sensitivities, uh, but we have, um, we're watching very closely what happens in Europe. We know there's a lot of strong support there, including in Germany, for uh, an ambitious and comprehensive agreement. And that's obviously, uh, you know, what we, what will be looking to see. That will be the most uh, likely uh, type of mandate that would lead to an ambitious agreement. Josh. Josh. Oh, thank you. Um, a quick question for Ben. Um, if you could clarify a little bit the rationale behind your decision to expand military aid for the Syrian opposition. Is it to defeat Bashar al-Assad <coughs> or to readjust, if it's still possible, the balance of power on the ground in preparation for the Geneva uh, Peace Conference, mm -hmm. and I have a second question as well. Sure. Well, as a general matter, uh, the best way to resolve the situation is through a political settlement, and Geneva is uh, the one framework that exists for a political settlement. Uh, and I think that's just common sense, given that you're either going to have a, an agreement reached between the two sides, uh, or you're going to have a military conflict that continues until one side wins. Uh, so we want to channel our efforts uh, in support of that political negotiation, but we fully understand uh, that there are huge obstacles to that, uh, particularly given uh, the uh, activities of the regime uh, and given the difficulty uh, in uh, them sending a serious signal that they're open to uh, a real political transition uh, in Syria and one that we believe would have to involve Bashar al-Assad leaving power. Our assistance as a general matter uh, is meant uh, to accomplish a number of objectives. Uh, one is to send a signal uh, to the Assad regime that there's a consequence for what they've done with respect to chemical weapons. Another is to strengthen uh, the opposition. Um, and again, ultimately, uh, we have chosen to support them uh, as uh, the legitimate representative that we're going to deal with uh, in terms of the Syrian people. Uh, so ultimately, our objective and our stated national policy is that Bashar al-Assad should lead power. We have a preference that that be done politically, uh, but we're going to continue to support those in Syria who are working for a post-Assad future. I heard as well, uh, Jay, this week, and yourself, you mentioned that the objective of the U.S. policy is a negotiated settlement uh, uh, for the Syrian issue. Um, does that mean that you still consider Bashar al-Assad an interlocutor in this process, in a negotiated settlement between the opposition and his regime? Yeah. Well, uh, we certainly see the uh, Assad regime would have to participate in any type of negotiation. Um, I don't think we've seen any proposal that Bashar al-Assad himself uh, would come to the table as a part of that process. But what we want to see in a negotiated settlement, if it can be achieved, is not a situation in which you dissolve the institutions of the state in Syria, um, but rather where you see Bashar al-Assad leave power and you see a, a governing authority come together that brings in the opposition, uh, but may maintain uh, certain elements of the state, certain institutions of the state, uh, certain uh, individuals who've been associated with the government. Um, in a government that, uh, again, can restore the unity of the country, respect the rights uh, of the people, and start to begin, again, to provide uh, services. So Bashar al-Assad himself, we think, needs to leave the stage here. Um, but clearly, uh, his regime is going to have to be part of any uh, political dialogue that we have in pursuit of, uh, in pursuit of that objective. Do have a couple of questions. I want to give you a break. Josh, I have some domestic questions I want you to take. Okay. You want to do that, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. 
could you resolve for us the situation of the student loans? Yesterday on the Senate floor, there was an attempt by Republicans to offer what they described as the president's specific proposal in the budget on extending the student loan issue that was objected to. Republicans are raising their what they might their minds a legitimate question is why wouldn't the president's own plan be embraced by Senate Democrats? Where are we on this, and what accounts for this apparent strategic confusion among Democrats on the president's <coughs> plan? Well, I know that there is uh, are a range of discussions that are ongoing between the administration and people on both sides of the aisle, particularly in the Senate, to try to to try to broker an agreement here that will prevent student loan rates from doubling at, at the end of this month. So there are a number of conversations that are ongoing. I don't know that I can uh, that I'm the best person to try to uh, to figure out the legislative machinations in terms of the uh, the uh, the steps that are being. Uh, negotiated in the Senate. Um, but we've laid out what we think is a pretty clear set of principles for how we can solve this problem and do it in a way that frankly should have appeal to both sides, uh, to people on both sides of the aisle. Are you now at the point where not having the President's own plan put on the floor is better? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think we'd be happy to see our plan passed. Uh, the question is, is if there are people who actually have to vote on that plan have their own ideas. And we are willing to uh, have conversations with them to try to broker an agreement that would reflect the interests of Republicans, Democrats, and the administration. So uh, we have our own plan. We like our plan. Uh, but if there are other people that have their own, their own ideas, we've laid out some principles that we would like to see. Um, for instance, we want to make sure that uh, students have an opportunity when they're repaying their loans to be able to work through an agreement that would limit their payments to 10 percent of their disposable income, for example, that there are provisions that would uh, limit the increase. Uh, of the interest rate uh, over time. Uh, you know, for example, we've talked about locking in the historically low rates. So there are some principles that we've put forward, but we're open to negotiations. Quite clearly, you understand there's a time element here, and the Senate has to pass something to get this to conference. Yeah, there's an urgent time element. We're talking about a couple of weeks here. Okay, so what's your instruction specifically to the Senate Democratic leadership that's uh, theoretically working with you on this? Pass the President's plan or get about something that's an alternative? Uh, well, we would like to see something move through the Senate that, um, that abides by some of the principles that we've laid out. Our plan does that, obviously, but there may be some other suggestions and we're open to some other ideas. Ben, you come back. Huh? Yeah. I just want to give you like a little bit. Josh. Right, we'll come back. Let Major finish up here. Uh, ben, the President drew the red line. He reinforced it many times. Yet he himself did not address this issue that the red line had been crossed yesterday, and he's not here today. No disrespect to the three of you, but this is the President's red line. What would you say to those who might think that this is not such a big deal because the president's not giving voice to this theoretically significant event. And even your own inability to describe with any specificity the arms that are being going to the rebels, this sounds like an incremental policy change that the president, by not talking about it himself, is sort of keeping his arms length. Well, Major, I think what I'd say to that is uh, the situation in Syria uh, is uh, an ongoing uh, challenge. And the president has repeated opportunities to speak to it. Uh, I'm certain he's going to have opportunity to speak to it, for instance, over the course of the several days that he'll be traveling uh, to Europe. Uh, he himself is the one who laid out uh, the red line uh, publicly. Um, but again, people have to understand that this is a very fluid and dynamic situation. Um, and the situation on the ground will have its own uh, twists and turns. Uh, our own policy has been one of uh, incrementally uh, increased support uh, for the opposition, uh, efforts to pressure the Assad regime. Um, but this is not something that's going to be resolved uh, with the turn of a switch. Um, and so uh, we've made clear what uh, our policy objectives are. Uh, we believe that uh, articulating those objectives can give people an understanding of what we're trying to achieve in terms of, again, strengthening the SMC in Syria, strengthening the opposition. Uh, it just, in situations like this, spelling out uh, the underlying details or the itemization of uh, material that may be going to the opposition is not something uh, we do as a, a general matter. But you can, un you can fully expect that the President will be heard on these issues uh, repeatedly in the coming days. Uh, and uh, the announcement we made yesterday very much reflected his guidance because he was the one who directed the intelligence community to pull together this assessment uh, and directed us to make it public. Just one more. It's clear from those who are fighting that it's taken a long time for some of the aid that's already been announced to get there. You acknowledged in the conference call yesterday even though you have these open pipelines, there are and have been bottlenecks. Isn't it worth assuming that it will be at least a couple of months before any of this other aid arrives because the bottlenecks are real, because the transit points are weak, and might that not be far, far too late? 
I would not make that assumption because, frankly, uh, it's true that there have been, um, you know, there there have been times in which we uh, couldn't move assistance quite as fast as we would have liked. But we've had opportunities over the course of the last several months uh, to get better. Uh, at establishing pipelines into the country. Uh, so we believe that uh, our own efforts have improved in terms of streamlining the means by which we uh, can work with some neighboring states uh, to supply uh, assistance into Syria. Uh, so I think we have essentially an established uh, pipeline and established lines of uh, communication and assistance uh, that allow us to take additional types of assistance and, and put that into that pipeline. So we're com comfortable and confident that uh, given the work that we've already done, uh, that we can flow assistance in uh, at a relatively uh, time and in a relatively timely manner. Mike Dorney. Uh, quick question for uh, Caroline. Um, on the TTIP trade stuff, mm -hmm. uh, given that the matter that my our German colleague uh, referenced the cultural parameters for the negotiations, we supposedly are going to be settled ahead of the G8 meeting by the European Union. What, if any, uh, material impact? do you anticipate these G8 discussions will have on the framework for the um, TTIP agreement? Do we anticipate anything coming out of this summit that would have a real impact on the scope or ambition of those trade talks, given that this other matter is supposed to be settled in advance? Yes, on the timing of that, as I said, I, I believe the EU is discussing this, uh, this matter urgently amongst trade ministers, we'll see if they are able to reach an agreement ahead of the summit. Uh, we understand that, of course, there are sensitivities on both sides. At the summit itself, trade and the value of, uh, of uh, open trade and high standards for new um, for trade agreements will be a part of the agenda, but the specific trade agreements such as you know TPP we're negotiating obviously with a number of allies include uh, Japan and Canada who will both be at the table there the EU and Canada are discussing we're in discussion separately on trade matters with uh, with the responsible EU counterparts that is not something that leaders themselves the specifics of negotiation not something that leaders themselves uh, in the course normal course of the sessions would um, would address and we don't currently have any any other um, meetings to deal with this scheduled Jen? Yes. Okay, a couple questions on, uh, on Syria first of all since we've determined, the United States has determined that there are these chemical weapons that have been used, does the United States know where they are and what steps would they take to destroy them? Uh, it's a good question, Jim. Um, we have been monitoring very closely uh, the Syrian chemical weapons stockpile. Um, we've been doing that, so have uh, a number of our allies. Um, so while we can say you know, with certainty uh, that we are aware of where every uh, chemical weapons munition is in the country. Uh, this is something we devote a lot of attention and resources to, and we feel like we have, uh, a, again, a sense of uh, both the fact of the regime controlling uh, these chemical weapons stockpiles and some sense of, uh, of where they are generally. Uh, in terms of securing them, um, this is something that uh, would be a priority for the United States, particularly in uh, a post-Assad scenario. Um, clearly, in the current environment, um, uh, they re remain under regime control, and there's a, a very active conflict in Syria. Um, but when we look at the types of issues that we're going to be focused on, and then we want the international community to be focused on uh, in Syria, uh, if we can reach a resolution, if we can get to a post-Assad Syria, I think you would see a very uh, intense focus uh, from the U.S. Uh, on making sure that steps are being taken to secure these chemical weapons stockpiles. And again, this is something that the international community can do. Uh, one example of that, for instance, is in Libya. Uh, there were uh, chemical weapons stockpiles, not nearly the, of the scale in Syria, uh, but in the immediate aftermath of the Libyan revolution, uh, we were able to work with uh, the relevant international bodies to ensure that experts got on the ground to secure those chemical weapons uh, and to begin the work uh, of, of destroying them. So this is something that uh, we'll be uh, focused on in terms of monitoring, but also in terms of planning for uh, post-Assad scenarios. But, during, but in the, during this scenario now, is it just too dangerous? Is it, is it because of the nature of the weapons themselves that you could not destroy them before Assad is gone? Well, that's a hype, uh, did, I'll take the hypothetical 
in this regard, which is that um, uh, it is, you know, these are dangerous weapons, and uh, the notion that you can destroy them if you aren't physically present is an extremely challenging one, uh, just given the nature of the weapon. Uh, so uh, the preference would clearly be um, to have this be a priority focus for uh, when the international community, and you know, again, it need not be the United States, a lot of the expertise lies in the international community, uh, will have the opportunity to, to, to make this a priority in a post-Assad Syria. If I can just one, one follow on one other question, and, that, and that's about, you, not from the White House, but all over every place else, there's lots of talk about a no-fly zone. What is more, is it more difficult in, to establish and more dangerous to establish a no-fly zone in Syria than it was in Libya, and is that why it hasn't been done at this point? Yes, it's dramatically more difficult and dangerous and costly in Syria uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that in Libya, you already had a situation where the opposition controlled huge portions of the country, and you could essentially protect those uh, portions of the country from the air. Uh, you did not have the same types of uh, air defense system that exists uh, within uh, Syria. Uh, so in that regard, it's more uh, difficult. But we also uh, look at the efficacy of a no-fly zone. Uh, and frankly, in Syria, when you have a situation where regime forces are intermingled with opposition forces, they're fighting in some instances block by block in cities, uh, that's not a problem you can solve from the air. Uh, so I think people need to understand that the no-fly zone is not some type of silver bullet uh, that is going to stop uh, a very intense and in some respects sectarian uh, conflict uh, that is uh, taking place on the ground. Um, and so uh, that's why we feel like the best course of action is try to strengthen a moderate opposition uh, that can uh, be able uh, to represent the broader uh, Syrian uh, public. Uh, we haven't ruled out options, um, but I think people need to understand uh, the, both the difficulty of uh, some of the options that have been presented, the fact that they don't solve the problem necessarily, and that we have to make these decisions based on U.S. national interests. And uh, we don't at this, thing, at this point believe that the U.S. has uh, a national interest uh, in pursuing a, a very intense uh, open-ended military uh, engagement through a no-fly zone um, uh, in Syria at this, at this juncture. But again, uh, we, you know, we, we aren't ruling out contingencies, um, but we're, we're weighing them in a very deliberate fashion. Uh, if this assistance to the opposition is not effective and the situation continues to escalate, could the president be forced to consider putting boots on the ground, or is that completely off the table? You know, the one option that we've basically uh, taken off the table is boots on the ground. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, uh, nobody has asked us to do so. Um, it, the, the Syrian opposition has not thought that that's a good idea. Um, we certainly don't think it's in our national interest to introduce <laughs> U.S. troops. We need to be humble here about um, our ability to solve a problem like Syria, um, certainly on our own. Uh, I think recent uh, history teaches us uh, that even when you have U.S. boots on the ground, um, you're not necessarily going to uh, be able to uh, prevent uh, uh, violence among civilian populations. We saw that uh, in Iraq, for instance. Uh, and at the same time, when U.S. boots are on the ground, that involves us in a much more dramatic way. It has a way of making us the issue uh, instead of uh, the future of, of the country where we are. Uh, so that's one, uh, that is one contingency that we're not uh, entertaining at this point. A, a hypothetical here, which I know you don't like to answer hypotheticals, but um, if, if Russia had been willing to apply the, the kind of pressure that you wanted you know, month, a month ago or six months ago or two years ago, would there be a different picture now? Would there have been a need for the United States to provide this kind of assistance uh, to the, the rebels? Um, well, they do give you a, a briefing when you um, become a national security staff person uh, against uh, entertaining hypotheticals. but. I will uh, entertain an aspect of it, which is that, you know, the, the, the time when uh, we think uh, Russian support, for instance, could have made a difference was when we were putting forward resolutions in the Security Council that would have imposed greater consequences on the Assad regime. Uh, and that was, you know, over a year ago. Um, and uh, time and again we saw uh, international action blocked at the Security Council by a Russian veto. Uh, that, for instance, at the time could have applied uh, a greater measure of pressure on Bashar al-Assad um, to consider whether or not to step down. I can't say that it would have accomplished that objective, um, but clearly we believe that uh, additional pressure from the international community, including Russia, uh, could affect Bashar al-Assad's calculus. That continues to be uh, the case today. But at the same time, you know, it's also uh, Iran and Hezbollah. 
And you have to ask yourself, why are Iran and Hezbollah so invested in what's happening in Syria? Um, uh, to us, uh, there is a bit of a sign of desperation involved. Um, Iran sees its only uh, serious ally in the region uh, significantly threatened. Hezbollah, uh, a force that has traditionally uh, not gotten engaged beyond uh, the borders uh, of Lebanon, has devoted a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, frankly, we see that as a sign of uh, vulnerability uh, from Hezbollah uh, and, and Iran. And frankly, it's turning uh, the people of the region dramatically against uh, Hezbollah. If you look at the standing of Hezbollah uh, in uh, the region in 2006, as against where they are today, uh, they are bleeding um, pu public support, political capital, and resources um, in Syria. Uh, and I think, again, that's a sign of vulnerability. And, uh, and I've got one for Josh as well. On uh, arming the rebels, as you know, Senator McCain has said over and over that he wants to see heavy arms, and he wants artillery, he wants anti-aircraft. I don't know if that's the right solution, but he keeps pushing that. Is that why you're not spelling out the details of what arms you're, you're sending or what aid uh, you're sending because it doesn't meet that threshold that the critics have set. No, that's not the that, that wouldn't be why we wouldn't get into specifics. I think as a general matter, uh, we're not going to get into specifics about um, uh, certain types of assistance that we provide. Well, what I, I don't what I will say Ed, is is that um, whatever we do, um, we also need to be careful um, uh, in uh, learning lessons of history that. Uh, you need to have some sense of where any assistance you're providing is going, whose hands they're falling into, and what potential dangers may be associated with uh, heavier weapon systems. Um, uh, so uh, those, those types of, um, uh, I think any time when, when you're considering these types of issues, uh, you'd have to uh, be cautious and deliberate in your, in your actions. But I don't understand the lack of transparency and just flatly telling the American people, here's what we're sending. If you were to institute a no-fly zone, I understand there needs to be secrecy in war and peace on, on some military yeah. movements, et cetera, of course. But if you instituted a no-fly zone, there would be some accounting of, we're sending this many planes, here's how we're doing it. Why is there secrecy around what you're sending? Well, I think if you were to introduce, you know, uh, uh, U.S. military forces through a no-fly zone um, activities of that nature, activities like we saw in Libya, um, clearly those would be things that uh, we would discuss in some detail. Uh, I think when you get into questions of uh, the provision of assistance um, uh, to opposition groups, um, we just uh, are more limited in our ability to again say, well, here's the inventory of everything that we're doing. Uh, I understand your question, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to it, Ed. Uh, I think uh, what, uh, what we can do is sketch out for you, here's the President's thinking, here's our policy, uh, and here are the objectives that we're trying to meet with our assistance. Uh, to strengthen the effectiveness of the SMC, uh, again, to strengthen their, co their cohesion, uh, to meet the requests, uh, some of the requests that have been made of us uh, from General Idris. Those are the types of uh, factors that are guiding uh, the assistance we're providing. Thank you. And there's one that you mo both may want to weigh in. There's been a lot of reporting about the President's trip to Africa, the trip after the G8. Uh, context should be that President Clinton spent a lot of money uh, on a trip to Africa. Uh, President Bush took, I believe, two trips to Africa, spent a lot of money as well. But in these budget times, after the sequester, after White House tours being canceled, a lot of attention on the fact that the president may spend up to $100 million in taxpayer money on a trip to Africa. Can you, can you justify that expense? Well, I'd say a couple things, and, and Josh may want to say something, too. Um, we, frankly, should have, uh, you know, uh, well, let me step back. We have not traveled to Africa in the same way that we've traveled to other regions of the world. Um, we have traveled significantly in Asia. We've taken several trips to Latin America. We've taken several trips to Europe. Uh, we've t taken several trips. Uh, we'll, we'll take multiple trips to Russia by the end, uh, by the time this year is done. Um, and Africa is a critically important region of the world. We have huge interests there. You've got some of the fastest growing economies uh, in Africa. You've got a, a massively growing youth population. You've got key security and counterterrorism issues that we work on with African countries. Uh, we have democratic uh, institutions that are consolidating in places like Senegal, South Africa, uh, and Tanzania. We have some of our biggest development efforts on issues like global health, combating HIV AIDS, things that have broad bipartisan support uh, that have been focused uh, on Africa. So for the United States to say we're a world leader, except in this continent, uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, and just as we, uh, again, uh, put a premium on developing our ties in emerging regions like Southeast Asia and Latin America, we need to be present in Africa. And I can tell you that there are other countries that are quite present in Africa. Uh, you've seen significant investments in Africa from China, Brazil, Turkey, uh, and the U.S. would be ceding its leadership position in the world. <coughs> the President of the United States 
uh, was not deeply engaged uh, in Africa. And that's what he's going to do. And this is a deeply substantive trip um, and one that has been highly anticipated on the continent. And frankly, there's been great disappointment that the president hasn't traveled to Africa until this point, other than a brief stop in Ghana. Uh, and so Senegal, you have a country uh, that is an emerging democracy, that is a partner with us in situations like Mali, uh, that we want to invest in uh, issues like food security uh, and the development of civil society. In South Africa, a leading country on the continent, partners with us on just about every issue, from Sudan to Congo to Zimbabwe. Uh, to the provision of our global health uh, assistance uh, and also the iconic democracy uh, of the continent, uh, as we've all been reminded in recent days with Nelson Mandela. Tanzania, similarly, has been a key partner in East Africa. Every major development initiative we have on food security, global health, uh, democracy promotion, Tanzania has been a solid partner. Um, and so the president's not going to retreat from an entire uh, continent. Um, on terms of the cost, we don't determine the cost of the president's security. Um, just as President Bush didn't, President Clinton didn't. The Secret Service is going to do what they think is necessary to protect the president. That's going to come with its own costs. Um, but we don't sit here and say we want to spend X amount of money on a trip. Um, but we do know that uh, from a foreign policy perspective, uh, in some respects, people believe this trip is o uh, overdue. Uh, and uh, frankly, there will be a great bang for our buck for being in Africa. Uh, because when you travel to regions like Africa that don't get a lot of presidential attention, you tend to have very long standing. Uh, and long-running impact from, uh, from, from the visit. But, uh, um, the, um, there's a movement on Capitol Hill among some lawmakers to exempt lawmakers and congressional staff from uh, having to comply with the president's health care law and enter into the insurance exchanges. Um, does the president disagree with that? Do you want to stop that? Since they're essentially trying to say, we don't have to go into this, but the rest of the country does. The president, as I recall, has already pledged that he would join an insurance exchange. So my question is, do you have any plans to stop this movement on the Hill? And do White House staff, the cabinet, do you all plan to, enjoy, to join these insurance exchanges? Well, I know that all, uh, a lot of discussion has taken place over the last 18 months or so about how to implement the Affordable Care Act and to do so in a way that is, uh, ensures that the large number of Americans that can take advantage for the first time of quality affordable health insurance and quality affordable health care uh, have access to it. Uh, that is a critical domestic priority that the President has laid out, and that's something that we are uh, devoting significant time and resources to, to getting done. So why would now, part of this just try not to join it then? If it's well, I think this is actually part of the law as it was originally passed would actually require uh, lawmakers to participate in the in the exchanges. But they're trying um, to get around it, I guess, now. It's, there's a well, movement I, to... I know that there's been some talk about how to sort of best, again, uh, best implement the law as it was passed. Um, it, it is my understanding, and I uh, and I know that this is something that we're working through as we work through this implementation, is that we're going to make sure that there's nothing that, um, that uh, lawmakers can take advantage of that the general public can't. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, for, I think, rather obvious reasons, an important principle. Um, but what our most important focus on here is making sure that the millions of Americans across the country that don't currently have access to health care uh, are going to get it for the first time. Uh, and it, we're also going to create opportunities for small businesses and, and families out there who right now are paying an, an exorbitant cost for their health care to offer them tax credits that are going to lower that, those costs. We've already seen how and seniors have gotten some assistance to afford their prescription drugs that millions of Americans across the country have gotten the opportunity to get cancer screenings and other preventative uh, health care measures for free. So there are a number of benefits of the Affordable Care Act that we're working to implement, uh, and that will continue to be a priority through the end of this year, particularly as the marketplace is get up and running at the beginning of next. Okay. Thanks, uh, Andre, I'll give you the last one. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> one for Ben and uh, one for Caroline. Okay. Uh, ben, I, I just want you to respond directly to a couple of criticisms that one hears all, all the time in Russia about Syria. Uh, one is selective use of evidence. Uh, there have been instances, uh, most recently I think in Turkey, where chemical weapons were intercepted that were meant for the rebels. So how do, uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, the, 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 the other criticism is about uh, Geneva II, uh, where uh, it seems that the U.S. originally made a commitment to a genuine effort to make peace with a pre uh, without a predetermined result. Now people are saying the Americans seem to have decided everything in advance and uh, are pushing through their agenda. Uh, so uh, what, is re what is your response to that? <coughs> well, on the first uh, question, Andre, um, 
uh, you know, as we said yesterday, we have not seen any evidence um, that the opposition possesses uh, chemical weapons. Um, in fact, what we see is the opposite, that the regime has maintained custody of these weapons. Uh, we uh, detailed uh, to the Russians uh, several incidents. We had dates associated and places associated with those incidents. Uh, as I said, we had multiple streams of information from intelligence, but also open source reporting, physiological evidence uh, of the use of sarin, uh, reporting from individuals that was corroborated. Uh, to us, that adds up to a very convincing information picture uh, that chemical weapons have been used and they've been used uh, by, uh, by the government. Uh, I've seen the statements by the uh, Russian government about this, but uh, again, we uh, believe uh, with a uh, high degree of confidence that clearly chemical weapons are used. We've got physical samples that uh, uh, demonstrate that point. Um, and we, again, don't see that the opposition has possession uh, of these weapons. But we'll continue our, our dialogue with the Russian government on this. With respect to uh, Geneva too, we share the goal with Russia of seeing if there can be a political settlement uh, to the challenge uh, within Syria. We have a difference with the Russian government about um, the fact that we believe that there is no solution that in which Bashar al-Assad Assad, uh, can stay in power. That's been a long-standing um, di disagreement that we've had. Um, but we still believe, uh, given the fact that everybody has a preference in uh, a peaceful resolution to the conflict, uh, in making an effort together with Russia and other countries to bring the parties to the table, but it has to be serious. Um, and frankly, where we've seen some lack of seriousness is on uh, the regime side, uh, where they offer kind of the traditional pledges of dialogue uh, without kind of a concrete uh, plan here uh, to transition to a different type of governing authority that can bring in uh, the broad representation of the Syrian people. But we'll continue uh, to pursue that, that objective. Uh, and like I said, um, we have a rel relationship with Russia and with President Putin uh, where we can have disagreements, uh, strong disagreements uh, on a set of issues, but still work together uh, on an agenda where we do share some common interests. Uh, and we've been able to do that under President Putin uh, on counterterrorism, on economic issues, uh, on Afghanistan. For Caroline, uh, simply, you, you mentioned FATCO. FATCO is uh, an American law, and if you want your international partners to comply with it, uh, what are you offering uh, in terms of reciprocity? You're right that FATCA is an American law, and what we're seeing is uh, general support and what we're hoping we will see uh, G8 support for the development by the OECD of uh, a standard that would be based on uh, FATCA. So there would be a symbol, sim single global standard for the kind of information exchange that is involved in FATCA. And we believe that's a very powerful tool. We've already seen it having a powerful effect on tax havens and illicit activity using such tax havens. So that's you what we are. Russians joining the, the, the regime? To the best of your knowledge, what is the Russian position? We'll, we'll have to wait and see what, uh, what comes out from the, from the G8 communique. Okay. All right. The last, the last thing is just for the week ahead. Uh, you've got a pretty detailed readout at the beginning of this briefing. Uh, the, the, pres the president will – let me finish here. The president's going to leave on Sunday night uh, for his trip to Europe. He'll be there uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, return to Washington late on Wednesday night. Uh, on Thursday and Friday, we don't anticipate at this point that we're going to have any public events, but the president will be here at the White House for, for meetings at that point. So thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend.